Welcome to the forum, live streamed worldwide from the Leadership Studio at the Harvard T.H. Chan School of Public Health. I'm Dean Michelle Williams. The forum is a collaboration between the Harvard Chan School and independent news media. Each program features a panel of experts addressing some of today's most pressing public health issues. The forum is one way the school advances the frontiers of public health and makes scientific insights accessible to policymakers and the public. I hope you find this program engaging and informative. Thank you for joining us. Hi, and welcome everyone. I'm Carolyn Beeler. I'm the environment reporter at PRI's The World and today's moderator. Our panelists, starting from my immediate right, are Gina McCarthy, the 13th administrator of the EPA and professor of the practice of public health in the Department of Environmental Health at the Harvard Chan School. There's another one like that. <laughs> <laughs> to her right is Wendy Jacobs, Emmett Clinical Professor of Environmental Law and Director of the Harvard Law School Emmett Environmental Law and Policy Clinic. Joining us remotely are Bill Ruckelshaus, the very first and also the fifth administrator of the EPA and strategic director of Madrona Venture Group, and Tom Udall, senator for New Mexico and the ranking member of the Senate Appropriations Subcommittee overseeing the EPA's budget. Today's panel is being presented along with my organization, PRI's The World and WGBH. We're streaming live on The World and the Forum's websites, as well as Facebook and YouTube. Uh, toward the end of the panel, we'll be taking questions both from the in-studio audience and online. Um, you can email those questions if you're joining us remotely to the forum at hsph.harvard.edu. And you can also take part in a live chat that's happening on the forum site right now. Um, with that housekeeping done, today we're here to talk about recent changes to American environmental policy. Um, President Trump, during his campa campaign, pledged to essentially dismantle the EPA. Today, two years in, uh, two years later, we're seeing how that promise is playing out and who the Trump administration has appointed to key posts, how they're interpreting environmental law, and which Obama-era rules and regulations they are rolling back. We're also seeing a totally different vision of what role science should play in informing policymaking at the EPA. That's going to be sort of our main topic here today. Um, and to kick things off, we've got a short video taking us back to May of 2017 when President Trump announced that he was going to roll back the Clean Power Plan. We've already eliminated a devastating anti-coal regulation, but that was just the beginning. Today, I'm taking bold action to follow through on that promise. My administration is putting an end to the war on coal. We're going to have clean coal, really clean coal. With today's executive action, I am taking historic steps to lift the restrictions on American energy, to reverse government intrusion, and to cancel job-killing regulations. And by the way, regulations not only in this industry, but in every industry. We're doing them by the thousands, every industry. And we're going to have safety. We're going to have clean water. We're going to have clean air. But so many are unnecessary, and so many are job-killing. We're getting rid of the bad ones. One after another, we're keeping our promises and putting power back into the hands of the people. First, today's Energy Independence Action calls for an immediate reevaluation of the so-called Clean Power Plan. Perhaps — Perhaps no single regulation threatens our miners, energy workers, and companies more than this crushing attack on American industry. Gina, you were the EPA administrator right before President Trump took office, in addition to what we just saw about the Clean Power Plan. Can you sort of go over an overview of what kind of policy changes we've seen since you left your sure. post? Uh, yeah, I'm, I'm happy to do that. I can tee stuff up, and others, hopefully all the experts will, will hit it out of the park. Go Red Sox. So. <laughs> 
but but uh, the one thing I wanted to just make sure everybody understood was that the Environmental Protection Agency is about the environment, but it is essentially a, a public health agency. So over the past you know four plus decades, the agency has taken reasonable steps forward that has resulted in in really saving millions of lives as well as frankly trillions of dollars in in cost. And so I'm, I'm proud of the work that it's done. But today what we see is that I think the president is trying to make good in his promise, which is he came in there obviously with an intent to roll back rules that were done. And frankly, most notably, everything the Obama administration did. Um, and and it, he has made that very clear. And he started with uh, withdrawing from the Paris Agreement. He's looking at re uh, eliminating the clean power plan, our clean car rules, our clean water rules, our chemical safety rules, and soon on mercury and air toxic standard. These are big rules that offer significant public health benefits. They simply save lives and they make our, our, uh, our ability to live healthy uh, and have our communities healthy. Uh, they advance those issues tremendously. Now the Paris Agreement, like all the rest, uh, were proposed without a clear uh, recognition of real science. It was a denial of the science. It was a reinterpretation of laws. Um, it was done in a way that I think will be detrimental to the economy as well as public health. And so, so what's happened is that when these rules have been done or changes that have been done have been uh, sent to the court, they've been shifted back to EPA because they took shortcuts. They didn't do the public process right. They didn't follow the science. They misinterpreted the law. And so right now we see that they're not being enormously successful in these rollbacks. But what is happening now is they're proposing rollbacks that they, I think, recognize that the courts will not support. They actually are estimating that they're going to, in some cases, be both disbeneficial to health, they're going to result in more people dying, but they also result in higher cost. And so the courts are going to scratch their heads a little bit. So what's happened is that the recent shift is not just to look at the rules, but to recognize that if they don't change the fundamental premise of those rules, they will not succeed in rolling them back. So now the attack is on the science itself. The attack is how both we do science and how and who gets to speak to the science for the agency, as well as how you estimate costs and benefits. So that the rules themselves now will have a stronger basis if EPA moves forward in order to get it, it, move these proposals forward because they will no longer be costing lives and they will no longer be as expensive. And they're, so they're, they're basically taking science information off the web page. They're dismantling the science advisory board. They're excluding the best scientists from being on there. They're looking at taking away the ability to consider the best science, especially the science that's been generated by the TH Chan School of Public Health, uh, which is why I'm here, because this ain't happening. Um, and, and they're putting folks that are like ExxonMobil folks and Chevron folks on the science advisory board. And they're putting Koch brothers uh, employees and shifting them over into um, our Office of Research and Development, where they can manage the scientists. So look, what we have here is now a change, it, not just in the rules, but in the, the way in which the agency does its work, our rules of the road. This is dangerous, not just because it's about dismantling. If EPA were a house, and, and what, what you, they did originally was start dismantling it room by room and people objected, they couldn't do it. So now what they're doing is chipping away at the foundation, mm -hmm. which is frankly a much more dangerous strategy and one that people will be less, it will be less visible. You'll have hard a time getting people anxious and, and active about it. Um, and it's a dangerous situation, I think, for, for us and for the future of our kids. Thank you, Gina. We'll get more to that sort of chipping away the foundation, I think, later in our conversation. But I want to turn things over to Wendy for some opening remarks about this legal question of how the EPA is dealing with, you know, some some challenges they see coming down the pike and that actually are already are already are being filed uh, to some of their regulatory changes. Thank you, Carolyn. And thank you, Gina. 
you know, EPA is in a tricky situation now because it has to reconcile conflicts and tensions between statutes and executive orders. So EPA really serves two masters here, Congress and the President. And when they give inconsistent directions, then EPA is in a precarious legal predicament, and that's where we are today. So on the one hand, EPA was created and is funded by Congress in order to implement and enforce, I don't know, about 20 statutes. But they have to do it in accordance with Congress's instructions. And there are some overarching common instructions among those statutes that Gina alluded to. Those are to protect human health and the environment, using the best available or latest science, and sometimes even pr providing an extra margin of safety. Those are the rules. Notably, none of the statutes directs EPA to cut costs to business or to protect the fossil fuel industry at the expense of health or to roll back two existing rules before a new one can be promulgated. None of that's in the statutes. But that is what President Trump is ordering EPA and other federal agencies to do, as you just heard on that clip. Um, but the president has no authority to revise the statutes. So EPA's had to come up with a variety of tactics to use to create the appearance that it is complying with the statutes, even though it really isn't in many instances. And the chief tactic, as Gina has pointed out, is if we change the inputs to our decision making, we get a different outcome. And in particular, the inputs <coughs> they're changing are the science inputs, and they're shrinking the health benefits that um, are quantified as a result of a rule in order to achieve the president's goals. And what's most offensive about all of this is they're doing it in the name of transparency. Mm -hmm. If you look at most of the rules that are emerging, they all recite, we're doing this to increase transparency in decision making, and really, that's not what's going on, but it sounds good. So um, some of the key tactics are, let's delay implementation of rules for more study, even though some of these rules, like the pesticide rules, have been studied for decades, and there really is no need for further study. But the first tactic is, let's delay. And there are now court decisions exhibiting the court's impatience with this tactic, and EPA has been um, has been losing those cases. Another tactic is to, ex as Gina said, to exclude key information from consideration in order to shrink the size of the health benefit of the rule. Because if there is no benefit, or if the benefit isn't very significant, then what do we need the rule for? Or why do we need a stringent a rule? And we're seeing this um, path towards the reevaluation of the ozone rule and the particulate matter rule. Um, the third tactic is, let's just ignore the science. And that's what they've done with some of the pesticide rollbacks, and that's what they're doing with the fuel standards rollback. They've got analyses that do not support the proposed rule because they're just ignoring the science. The fourth tactic is to reconfigure and shrink the expert advisory committees in order to get the right advice going into the rulemaking or to remove and reassign key expert employees in order to avoid getting the wrong advice. There are lots of other tactics. I know we're supposed to keep this short, so I'll save the rest for later. But my favorite tactic is the one that the president uses. Let's just declare that what we're doing or not doing is legal. Let's not worry about whether it is or we'll just say that it's legal. That's my favorite tactic. But in any event, <laughs> among the bad news, the good news is that we have elections coming up now and again in a couple of years. And there are a variety of legal tools to fight back. And we all need to engage in these issues and use these tools. We can't just leave it to the state attorneys general in Massachusetts, California, and a couple of other states. We all need to participate. Um, and in the next part of the discussion, I know that we're going to talk about specific actions that each of us can take and must take to protect ourselves, our children, our communities. I had a couple of slides that we were going to tee up just for you to have going forward. 
one of them, this one is, you know, I said that this is the governing law. I just pulled a few quotes. We're not going through them now. But for those of you who do decide to take action, this is the governing language in the statutes. The next slide is something that we'll talk about in a bit, but I had to get all my slides in at once. And that is that in my clinic, we've developed a manual to help ordinary citizens and to help scientists get involved, to, to really help them work through the various processes for getting involved. And the third slide is a link to our clinic's website where we have a lot of other resource materials to help people fight back. Great. Thank you. Thank you, Wendy. Um, I think we would like to go next to Bill Ruckel's house, who's joining us remotely for your um, opening remarks. Bill, you led the EPA under two presidents, Nixon and Reagan, and served in times that were uh, very politically divided also. What are some environmental health issues that you see that have actually gathered or generated bipartisan agreement or that, that could? Well, the, the Environmental Protection Agency was a result of bipartisan cooperation. Uh, there was very little uh, dispute over the basic structure that the law provided that Wendy and Gina have both described. Uh, and that, that formed the infrastructure of our effort to protect public health and protect the environment uh, from 1970 on, essentially. And the, the country is appreciably better off from the standpoint of cleaner air and cleaner water as a result of what EPA has done over that almost 50 year period now. What they have described is a, an administration that is essentially tearing that infrastructure down, doing everything they can to change it so that it doesn't have the same impact uh, on industry is one of their principal interests, but also doesn't have the same impact on the public. It has a much worse impact on the public because they're not being protected uh, like they were before. Uh, they both have mentioned, both Gene and Wendy have mentioned that the EPA statutes are essentially public health statutes. The determination of what that public health impact is, is essentially a scientific uh, judgment. The scientists say what the problem is under the EPA uh, standards, uh, statutes, and then EPA and, and plus the, stand, the scientists sometimes cooperate and work together with the agency and determine what should be done about them, uh, the impact that these, uh, uh, these substances that they regulate are having. And if if it has happened over the last 50 years, the agency is diligent about trying to identify the biggest risk and do something about it, then the, the health of the American people will continue to improve. The opposite is also true. People are going to be hurt very badly. More of them are going to be hurt. Some of them are going to die as a result of exposure to substances that are no longer controlled the way they once were, and that is a real tragedy. Great. Thank you, Bill. Uh, and Senator Udall, thank you for your patience. Um, on to you for your opening remarks. Um, you, uh, Bill was mentioning, you know, changes in regulations with toxics. You've been watching closely and, and actually pretty involved in how rules and regulations around chemicals and pesticides are changing within this administration. Will you tell us, first of all, just what you've been seeing and advocating for and how your constituents are actually being affected by these changes? You, you bet. And it's a uh... It's a real honor to be with you here today and to have uh, to participate with you, Carolyn, Gina, and Wendy, this very, very distinguished panel. First of all, what we had happening um, in the chemical safety space for 25 years before the Obama administration tackled it was a chemical safety law that was broken. And the courts emasculated it in 1991, and we didn't really put a strong law in place until 2016. Uh, it's a good, strong law. I know some of the people that work for Gina said uh, that this is probably the strongest law in the world in terms of regulating chemicals and getting to the public health issues that the panel has talked about. Um, and then what we saw was a remarkable 
uh, under the Trump administration with that ruling that happened, a remarkable uh, disaster in terms of how regulations were put in place for the strong law and how the implementation of the law was undertaken. Uh, Carolyn, you've asked me, you know, what are my constituents thinking? Have they, uh, what's happened with this good law and how has it gone so awry? Uh, basically, what I would say, as far as the chemical part of this particular law and what the EPA does, the agency has been captured by the industry. Lobbyists in the industry, uh, it was mentioned earlier, the Koch brothers have the person running the regulatory and science office in the agency, not a professional, not a person uh, that really should be doing that kind of job. So what uh, I've tried to do with my subcommittee is do oversight of the EPA. We did it for close to 18, 19 months with Pruitt and now with Administrator, um, with Administrator Wheeler. We've looked at how they're implementing TOSCA. We're looking at the um, uh, science office and how it's being managed and what the people uh, are in place there. We're looking at how they're disregarding science in terms of coming up with regulations and protecting public health, which is really an astounding thing because EPA has some of the best scientists in the world looking at these public health issues. And then the administration appears to just be abandoning the bedrock science in terms of analyzing issues and putting uh, public safety uh, into public uh, health first and number one. Uh, we're also seeing and we're doing oversight there on the gutting of the clean power plant. But my conclusion is what people want uh, is they're asking for a credible regulator. You have two credible regulators in front of you, Gina McCarthy and Bill Ruckelshaus. They had a history of looking at everything that was around them, everything that was coming in, relying on the scientists and doing the very best they could to come up with decisions in terms of public health. So that's where we want to be. We're certainly not there right now. Thank you. Thank you, Tom. Uh, and on that note, talking about toxics and chemicals, we have another short video, this one from the Environmental Working Group that gives a bit of an overview uh, of, of some of the health impacts of what you were just talking about. When you look at the numbers on children's environmental health, what you see is that a whole series of chronic non-communicable diseases in American children are on the rise. So childhood asthma has increased threefold, 300% since the 1970s. Childhood uh, cancer, uh, the death rate is down, but the incidence of childhood cancer, the number of new cases per 1,000 children, has gone up 40%. Childhood obesity has tripled. Uh, rates of neurological problems are, are skyrocketing. And people ask, well, what's causing this? And I respond by saying, well, it's, it couldn't be genetics. Genetics simply doesn't bring about change that quickly. And so it's environment, and I think it's a combination of toxic chemicals, lifestyle changes. We're beginning to identify some of the specific chemicals that cause these diseases. The overarching mission here is that if we can discover the chemicals that cause disease in children, then we can take action to prevent exposures to those chemicals. As a parent, I know all this information about chemical pollutants, contaminants, which product to buy, which product not to buy, can be extremely overwhelming. But at EWG, we really try to provide information to cut through the noise so that you know what to focus on, places where you can take direct action that may, that, that may benefit your child's health. We are having an impact. Change is happening in the market. We're seeing cosmetics companies, cleaners companies reformulate, but at the same time, there's a significant amount of work to do. There, there's still hundreds of contaminants that we have very little safety information on um, and other contaminants that, that are of concern and are still in products on the market and on the shelves today. Tom, I wanna go back to you for the first question after that video, um, because you were just talking about your role as a, as a sort of oversight person on, on the EPA's uh, toxics rules. Um, but how can people who aren't legislators like you help drive sort of uh, environmental policy and, and the legislation of toxics and things like that from citizens to scientists? Well, well let's, uh, let's look a little bit at uh, what's happened with one chemical. Uh, that's chlorpyrifos, and that chemical impacts children, it impacts their brains, 
Uh, and the agency, the EPA, had been studying for a long time for Pyrifos uh, under uh, Gina McCarthy and previous administrators with 30 years of science. And what had happened uh, is at that particular point, uh, we, we came into the end of the Obama administration. They recommended the ban of chlorpyrifos because of the impact on children. So what we ended up uh, seeing is the science building up and building up and saying, we have got to make sure we protect our children. What ended up happening as soon as the Trump administration took over, they said, oh, we don't want to do that. We're going to keep it on the market. And what we saw in terms of your question is nonprofits like the Environmental Working Group and many other citizens stepping up, Moms for Clean, Moms uh, Clean Air Force, a lot of these uh, uh, individuals getting organized, working through the system and saying, this is unacceptable. And so when the administration put up an administrator who was really a pawn of the chemical industry, what ended up happening is citizens' involvement defeated him uh, in getting into the position uh, in the agency. So I was very encouraged from the grassroots effort uh, that is out there. Uh, this is not a mob like is talked about. These are serious citizens that are out there working to improve their society, and that's the right they have under the Constitution. Now, just to, one more point on this, uh, this chemical I'm talking about, just to see how widespread it was. Chlorpyrifos is used on a number of fruits, a number of vegetables. So I tested my own blood, uh, and I had measurable levels of chlorpyrifos. So my guess is, is anybody uh, about my age is going to have this chemical in their body? Not particularly bad for somebody my age, but for children who are developing who are very vulnerable, that's a big impact. So what we've had to do now that the Environmental Protection Agency isn't doing its job, we put in a law to ban for Pyrifos. And unfortunately, we don't have an EPA that's working for the public health and working for people. But that's, uh, that's where we are on citizen involvement. We need citizen involved. We need citizens to care. Unfortunately, I think that most people believe that if you um, go down to the hardware store or go to the grocery store, you, in fact, are being protected by the EPA and the things you buy. And that's no longer the case. So we've got to get the EPA back and get a credible regulator in there. Sorry. Well, uh, I should More probably add, add, Senator, that, that when, uh, when uh, Scott Pruitt decided that he was going to keep Clopyrifos on the market, that was challenged in court by many of the same advocates. And, and the, if, if anybody wants to read a blazing uh, court decision, read that one, <laughs> uh, because it basically sent yeah. it back to the agency and said within 60 days this thing is going to be banned. And they use words like, and you made a mockery of the statute. Now, it's a good thing to call it that because the statute says you must have absolute proof that it's safe in order to continue with it. And he decided that there were too many questions that he couldn't decide. Not a good way to describe your decision, if that's the statutory requirement for, on the, in the, the, for, for making it. So, so it's, citizen engagement, information, still remains the power of the people in a democracy. And, and that worked. And I think we're, we're certainly hoping that many others do as well. But you yeah, are a courageous Kara, leader, Senator. No oh, need to point Kara. a finger at you, except you're far away from me. You did a wonderful mm -hmm. job in moving that statute forward, uh, and, and it, will be, it will be implemented properly at some point. And, and we thank, will owe you a great debt of gratitude. Thank you, Gina. And just to follow up, Carolyn, on that, uh, those lawsuits were brought by groups of citizens who have organized as nonprofits, some of the most capable lawyers in the country that get into federal court and then uh, argue the case. You're hurting our children. You're hurting seniors. You're hurting public health. And the courts see that and reverse it. So citizens have a lot of power in the system still if they exercise it and get involved. 
I know that every time there's a new regulation that's rolled back, there are already lots of groups that are have already done the groundwork of how they're going to challenge that in court. Um, so, Wendy, uh, did you want to talk more about citizen engagement in terms of? Yeah, I mean, I, I agree with everything that that Tom and Gina have said, and it, I had actually noted one of the quotes from that decision. It's a wonderful decision. Is the judge says if Congress's statutory mandates are to mean anything, the time has come to put a stop to this patent evasion. It's a wonderful decision. But unfortunately, there's a lot that has to be done before you can get into court on these things. And that's where citizens really have to be involved. You know, we have to gather. So we have two things going on. We have the enforcement of the existing laws, which is not happening as, as the agency cuts into its staffing and cuts into its funding. That has ramifications for states as well. So there's real room for citizens to engage in gathering data to establish violations of the existing law and pursue enforcement actions. So that's one way citizens can be involved. Another is when EPA is putting out these either proposed rulemakings or announcements of proposed rulemakings, to gather data, to gather forces together, and file meaningful comments opposing the action that EPA is proposing to do. And in that regard, it's really important that scientists and economists continue to do their work because without the science and without good economic analysis of the benefits of the rules of taking action to protect public health and the environment, it makes EPA's job rolling these things back easier. So it's really, really important that scientists continue to do their work and not just publish it in esoteric academic journals, but actually send it into the agencies so that it's in the agency's hands. Send it in again when it's time to comment on a rule. Um, and I would urge economists to really take a lead in, in quantifying the benefits of our rules because it's much harder to quantify those benefits than it is to quantify the costs to industry. I I'm wondering, it feels to me just Let as, me, oh, Bill, did you have something to add? Let me try to respond to what a, a couple of uh, questions that have been raised. If the citizens really want to have an impact, they have got to let it be known to their elected officials that under no set of circumstances is it okay to continue to use these whether it's a toxic substance or an air pollution that's not adequately controlled or a water pollution problem, they are not going to be returned to office unless they pay attention to what's going on. This is what happened back in the 19, late 60s and early 70s. The public elected, elected officials, including the President of the United States, know that he, if he didn't protect their health, if he didn't protect their environment, they were going to turn on him. Most people don't realize that President Nixon, who did start a lot of this stuff, became disenchanted with his own policies. And as he got closer to the election in 1972, 20 days before the election, he said that he was going to veto the Clean Water Act, which was then up for, for uh, reauthorization. He did veto it. 20 days to go, with it. he was running against McGovern and was 20 points ahead in the polls. He had no concern about not being reelected. His veto was overruled in 48 hours with 21 votes in favor of the veto, even though the, the Congress was about a half Republican then. And, and the same thing happened with uh, other things that, that Nixon did. He, he messaged as clear as could be that he was going there, they weren't going to tolerate in action on these environmental standards. That's what's missing today. These, these court cases are really important. Tom Udall's work is exemplary. He's doing the best he can. But the public has got to say, I'm just not in favor of what EPA is doing. I'm demanding that what EPA is doing be carried on. Then their health will be protected. 
I, I have a question about, you were mentioning the sort of bipartisanship, I think. You know, the environment has become such a partisan issue, and it wasn't always the case, especially when you talk about climate change. D does anybody on the panel see any sort of areas where there might be or there already have been bipartisan uh, collaboration on issues of the environment? And, and what are some ways that it might be possible to make this less of depoliticize this issue? Is that is that possible or is that not possible in the short term? Carolyn, the, the one area, and it can be expanded on a little bit that I mentioned earlier, the um, the Trump administration put forward a scientist by the name of Mike Durson uh, to to run uh, a major part of what was going on in the uh, Environmental uh, Protection Agency. Durson, uh, his uh, uh, position there would have had a huge impact. Citizens organized, bipartisan group of senators stepped forward and denied him the nomination. And so... What you have there is people responding to uh, their constituents saying, this guy isn't the right guy for EPA. Uh, what happened with Scott Pruitt and all of his scandals? I think it was incredible that he was there as long as he was there. I think President Trump liked all the dismantlement of regulations and the things that he was doing, but his scandals were so big that he ended up being thrown out. And it was Republicans, some of whom that spoke up along the way. It took way too long, uh, but I must say that I don't think there has uh, uh, been a lot of Republicans speaking up with Democrats on things. I've given you a few highlights, but I think we need a lot more checks and balances. We need Republicans really stepping up to the plate and saying this is wrong, what the Trump administration's going, uh, what they're going to do in terms of hurting public health, children, families, uh, and and having that kind of impact. Thank you. Can can, can I just add a, a little bit? And, th and that is that, um, you know, I've I've worked for five Republican governors. Uh, now, mind you, they are Republicans in New England, <laughs> which many people see as sort of moderate moderate Democrats elsewhere. Um, but but you know, there there has been progress made under Republican administrations, without question. And, and you're right, it's more contentious than it's ever been, but let me tell you some of the dynamics I see that's playing into that. One is that, you know, it was pretty easy to get people anxious about pollution when you could see it, mm -hmm. when you could taste it. You know, and, and it's been pretty difficult to explain to people as an administrator of EPA that we've fallen short, there's more work to be done. You can't be complacent. I can remember doing mercury uh, work when I was in Massachusetts and, and I was doing a, f a program where we exchanged, you know, those glass mercury thermometers for digital thermometers. And it was one weekend and my sister-in-law was minding my kids and she said, what are you doing, Gina? I said, well, I'm exchanging these things because mercury is really a neurotoxin. It can hurt your kids. And she said, that is ridiculous. If it were a neurotoxin, they'd never put it in a glass thing like that. The government wouldn't allow it. I'm like, I am the government. <laughs> we do it. You know, so people sort of are complacent about this. They actually think because they can't see it, it's not happening. But the interesting thing is as much as this administration really wants to roll back and make coal the energy of the future, clean energy is going like crazy. It is, it is really moving faster than anybody anticipated. I, my, my sense is that in the real world, people are not buying this, this jargon that's happening at the administration, like it's the Republicans hate clean air and the Democrats like it. It's simply untrue. But there's no safe place right now for Republicans to be speaking up. But there's a lot of discussion in the background about what do we do about climate change. And there's a lot of Republican governors buying clean energy today. Mm -hmm. And so somehow we, I think there's a real fear factor with this president that is, that is quelling an ability to have a normal conversation about this. But that's just my, that's just my thoughts. You know, there's also- Carolyn, Carolyn, oh, yeah. just to- uh, to build on what Gina said, and excuse me, Wendy, I didn't mean to no, no. talk over you. The, uh, um, there is an enormous amount done in our, our federalist system. When you have a system where 
The states have a lot of responsibility for health, uh, for protecting citizens, for protecting children and families. What happens when you get the vacuum at the federal level, they, they, um, uh, the states step up. And we're seeing great bipartisanship there in legislatures and governors working on these issues. And Gene has given a great example on climate change. I mean, look at, look at how we're progressing in terms of clean energy right now. Wendy, over to you. Yeah, no, I was going to say, in addition to the bipartisan issue between Republicans and Democrats, not all businesses love mm -hmm. the Trump administration either because it, he's <coughs> introducing so much uncertainty about what the regulatory framework will be going forward. And a perfect example is, I mean, this one just blows me away, is that under the Obama administration, we recognize that HFCs were a bad replacement for ozone. And they're bad for greenhouse gas emissions and climate change. And we had, we were, you know, going to participate in a new international treaty to ban HFCs in American products. Well, some of the major manufacturers of refrigerants and coolants stepped up to bat, invested millions of dollars to find safer replacements for HFCs. Now the Obama, uh, now the Trump administration comes in and says, the heck with it, we're going to stick with HFCs. And we've got a whole group of businesses that have been petitioning the Trump administration, please keep this rule in effect. Sign the Kigali Amendment to the Montreal Protocol. We've done what we're supposed to do. We're ready to move forward to do the right thing. You're in our way. Um, and it's, it's mind boggling. Yeah. <laughs> Well, the, the other, in, in, I mean, there's so many interesting ones, but the, the one I like the best is, is basically uh, the Edison Electric Institute and others, which, which are the main lobbying entity for the utility industry, wrote to Administrator Wheeler his first day, first or second day in office, and said, don't get rid of the mercury and air toxic standard rule. We're done with it. Mm -hmm. We like it. It worked out. We're getting reimbursed for our expenses in the system. If you mess this up, we're all in trouble. And they're still pursuing it. And Ford's going, hey, wait, 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 wait. And them and other uh, automakers are saying, wait, wait, wait. I didn't really mean that I wanted to get rid of all those clean <laughs> cost standards because then I won't have a national program and you're really going to mess up my business. Right. So it's really bizarre to have a president with a list of things to do that he thinks is benefiting industry. And the industry itself is saying, you're creating huge uncertainties in the market and final rules are hard to do for the very reason that you want certainty. You don't want them redone every time there's a change in an administration. But I don't feel strongly about any of this. <laughs> <laughs> we can tell. Yeah. Um, I want to move on to questions from the audience now. Uh, we have one, a couple that we got ahead of time. So I'm going to throw one to the panel that's on a, a topic that we sort of touched on earlier, um, but I want to get more into, which is um, what's the possible impact of science, scientific transparency on health studies and environmental regulation? Um, what can researchers do to push forward environmental regulation? This is a question from Quan D who might be somewhere out there. Um, I know him, he's really good. Okay. <laughs> uh, well, uh, let, let me, uh, Bill probably can handle this better than I, but I, uh, just to, to kick it off is that, you know, uh, the, the, the challenge on science is, uh, is a very important one for us to follow. And I think everybody's concerned about if the if the the rules of the road on science change, then we could we could have some difficulty. Uh, and Wendy, you know this because the courts give such deference to EPA on their science and their analytics, and so it's extremely disconcerting to have this in the mix. Um, and so I do think, but you know, I have trouble thinking that some of the fundamental changes on transparency are going to be successful. Mm. I mean, what they're basically saying is that in order for you to consider the science, you have to have every bit of in raw data, including people's personal health information, available 
to Senate staffers, apparently, to be able to reanalyze, which is, which is not the way science is done. Right. And the best science is actually done in a way where you have enough information that you can actually very legitimately follow individuals in their health circumstances and environmental exposures over time, cohort studies. And in order to do that, you sign confidentiality. Nobody wants their personal information displayed you know, across the world. And so this is really about making sure that science can be done in a credible way. And the problem that EPA has with their secret science or their transparency argument is that, is that for a little science rule, which generally it's hard to get people engaged on, they got 600,000 comments including the Department of Defense saying, what are you, nuts? <laughs> because if you, if you really take this as a rule at EPA, it is a rule everywhere. It yeah. dictates how science is done. And it will dismantle the very processes at FDA and others who rely on similar studies to make the best decisions because it's the best science that they're trying to preclude. So lawyers tend to be risk averse when it comes to predicting the outcome of litigation, but this is one that I feel really strongly EPA has virtually no basis for prevailing in court. Mm -hmm. um, you know, and, and, and I'm really proud that Harvard came together and we wrote a set of comments that the president of the university signed off on, all the ch presidents of the hospitals, the deans of the School of Public Health and Medicine. We had a hundred people sign off and I'm sure those comments helped contribute to EPA now backing away a bit at least in the timing of this rule. But I'll tell you why I think it has very little legal basis and that is EPA has been in court as recently as 15 or 20 years ago taking the very position when industry said we can't abide by one of your rules because you're not providing all of the raw data underlying the science on which you're relying, EPA took the position that we don't need the raw data in order to validate a study. I mean, so this is, they have no reasonable basis for switching positions now. Furthermore, the real experts in deciding how a study should be validated are the scientists, not the policymakers. And we have scientists struggling very hard to come up with rules about what, it, what does it mean to be transparent in our reports? To what lengths can we go to make our study design, methodology, and information available to our peer reviewers? So there are policies already in place in the scientific community that are being refined to support um, a, a, a definition of what is transparency that will not require the violation of other federal laws that require <laughs> confidential um, human health data to be maintained private. So I think this is one where EPA really went over the edge in this rule and you know calling it trans strengthening transparency is just a, a ruse. And you know you mentioned before we got up here that they the EPA moved that from sort of the fast track to the slow track yeah. of regulatory changes because of that high volume of of pushback they well, got. I want people to understand that that, and this is really important, is that people ask what they can do. You know, submitting comments on a rule is an essential part of the public process, but it is also an essential part of the legal process, because when you when uh, I'll give you an example, the Clean Power Plan, uh, all told between proposal and final, received about eight million comments. Oof. A lot of comments, right? I did not read them all, I will admit that. I would still be chugging away at it had I tried. But, but you, in, in the final rule had something in the order of four, four million. And, and the, what you have to do when you receive a comment is you, the law requires that you actually respond to those com comments. The, uh, you, you, anything that's substantive, you have to respond to. So you put out a clean power plan that's about this big, the technical documents are about this big, and the response to comment 
is equally large because all those four, four million, many of them were, I signed something and I sent a letter in, but there was more than a couple of maybe 22,000 or so individually separate technical issues that were raised that were substantively important. Each and every one of those had to be commented on. It took time, and if you fail to actually address a substantive comment that could have had an ability to change the outcome, boom, the court sent it right back to you. you and you this, either this, vacate uh, the rule or, I'm sorry, go ahead, Bill. I was going to say this debate over transparency is part of the residual that uh, results from a lack of trust. Fundamentally, what's involved here is the EPA, if it's going to be effective in our free society, it needs to be trusted. And I think it deserves to be trusted and should, uh, should have been trusted over time, but that has eroded to the point where you have these uh, extraordinary distortions of a good principle about being open, transparent, but it doesn't make any sense out of the way they're trying to implement it. It's very hard to get a change because the polarization, the political polarization, Jesus on an issue like this and tries to embarrass the administration. And all of it erodes the fundamental institutions we've established to protect public health on the EPA. Uh, and we, we simply need to get common sense back into this and political rubric out. And that's going to be hard, Bill, because of the way they've reconfigured the advisory committees, among other reasons, is we're now going to have EPA putting in, you know, once it's challenged in court, EPA will have a record for the court that suggests that its experts support the outcome mm -hmm. of the proposed rule. And that really does, as Gina says, puts an enormous extra burden on the public to be sure that we don't just sign form letters, but that we come forward with meaningful information to refute the basis, whether it's the science, the economics, the technology basis for some of these rules. And we need to go back to what the statutes say, which is why I prepared that little chart for, of the statutory language. That's the standard, not what the president says the standard is. It's what Congress said the standard was. And if EPA does doesn't stick with that standard, it is our job to point it out first to EPA in our comments so that they have a chance to do the right thing. And if they don't do the right thing, then we have a basis for uh, challenging the decision in court. I want to get to Sounds a couple. Like there's going to be plenty of room for lawyer work. <laughs> yeah, yeah, for a long time to come. I want to get to a few more questions before we have to wrap up. Are there any questions from the in-studio audience before I get back to some online ones? We have a microphone available. Let's wait till the mic gets to you and then. It's been interesting to me that EPA has decided to do, try to do the, what they're calling the transparency and consistency initiatives through regulation. Um, do they actually need regulate, new regulations in order to move forward with the sorts of things that they're proposing? Well, it depends on what you mean by the sorts of things they're proposing. Um, it, it they often use, and Gina's better to answer this than I am, but they often, the administrator will issue or the president will issue guidance to direct the agency in the sort of logistics and mechanics of how to operate. But if they're going to actually implement a rule that Congress has delegated, uh, uh, implement a statute by means of a rule that it does, you know, that does have to be done by rule. To do something substantive under a statute statute has to be done by a rule, and that rule has to go out, the proposed rule, to public notice and comment. Uh, so in, in um, this, go ahead. Gina, and, and you can add to this. Uh, um, when we passed the Toxic Substances Control Act uh, there in 2016, that's just the first step. Right. And what Gina and her agency was trying to do with Tosca in the six months she had to finish up is put in place a regulatory system that would implement what the Congress was trying to do. And unfortunately, because there was only six months, they didn't quite finish that. And so those very good regulations that were started 
were pulled back, and now there are a lot of what's being done to re uh, to what they would call reevaluate, but it's really roll back what Tosca was trying to do. So it's very, very important for people to understand. It isn't just a law. It's the implementation of the law, and it's the regulations that specifically focus in on the science and the public health, making sure we get all of it right. And, and I think, you know, uh, it, just to round this out, EPA has, has both rulemaking, and they do that when they essentially know that there is a, a a fundamental change in which the agency is doing its work, and, and in order to really implement that effectively, you go through a rulemaking, or the law requires it. You have guidance documents, and you have policies. And all of those issues are in play today. And, and I think one of the challenges that we're seeing is some of the most fundamental things that they've already done uh, by policy um, are things that, that eventually get captured in di uh, uh, guidance documents or they get captured in rules, but they're implementing them now anyways. You know, and, and so you have things happening like uh, they're, they're telling states not to worry about changes done at large utilities because they're, they're changing the definition of what's big and what's little. You know, they're doing all kinds of uh, sort of things that, that weaken the ability of the agency to function now. And they're changing, you know, the, the, I think the hallmark of EPA has been that it's done good science. It's captured it in a, a public process and done it well, but it's implemented it. And the big piece that people are forgetting is the agency is not implementing or enforcing its rules now, even the ones that are on the books and they're not talking about. Mm -hmm. So we have some fundamental challenges today, uh, never mind what, the, what might happen uh, in the future. Well, on that cheery note, yeah. thanks. <laughs> it's time to wrap up. Um, thanks to everyone here in the studio audience and um, online for your questions. We didn't have time to get to all of them. Um, but we've covered a lot of ground here today. So just before we all part ways, I wanted to ask each of our panelists to give us just a 30 second or one minute takeaway message or policy recommendation that we can take with us after we are finished watching this forum. Um, let's start with you, Gina. Vote. <laughs> Very simple. First you register, then you vote. All right, that was about two <laughs> seconds. I like it. <laughs> Wendy, you want to go next? Yeah, I would say each of us has the responsibility and the power to stand up and defend ourselves. We can't assume other people will do it for us, and we need to do it now and not wait until 2020. And there are tools out there to help you. Okay. Uh, Tom, to you next. Uh, thank you, Carolyn. I, I think one of the things that is the most important here is to put in place real checks and balances. We have 18 days to this election, many places you can vote early and absentee right now. And I think what we're going to see in this election is a real pushback against some of the things this administration is doing and putting checks and balances in place so Congress plays a significant role in public health and climate change and moving us in the right direction. Thank you very much. It's great to be with you. And Bill, last word to you. Well, I'm so convinced that trust is important uh, in this whole area that uh, whenever the agency acts in a way that it does not foster trust among the public, the public raises its hand and says so. Uh, and with a strongly supported, like it was in this in the late 60s, early 70s, set of environmental and public health laws and regulations. Uh, our country will once again be marching forward and leading the world on these very important issues, which at one point we did lead the world. So that's all we need to pledge to do today is lead the world. <laughs> Uh, thank you all panelists uh, for participating. Thanks to our audience both here in the room and remotely for your thoughtful questions. Um, please consider tuning in for the next forum here, Stroke, Successes and Setbacks with a Notorious Killer. That's on November 22nd from noon to one and you can get more information on that or any of the forum's programming at forumhsph.org. Thank you everyone. Thank you. Thanks.